Let me tell you about these two. These two papers that uh, we put out last year uh, in collaboration with uh, Andy Svesco at the uh, University College London, uh, Watse Sibesma uh, in Iceland, and Manus Visser that is, is in uh, Geneva. Uh, so the first one uh, is a very long paper, like 100 pages. Um, we basically revisited uh, the semi classical JP model and uh, we analyzed in very detail the, the problem of back reaction. And we studied the thermodynamics, including semi classical effects. So that was a very long paper. Um, in the mo more recent paper, it's a very short one. Uh, we use the same results to apply it to uh, a problem of interest that is the, the problem of Hawking radiation and the relation in the relation with the black hole information problem. So I'm gonna be mostly focusing on the first one, but uh, uh, the last one is very quick. Uh, if I have time, I can show like, a, few, a few slides on, on that one. Uh, <clears throat> so our basic motivation was uh, uh, studying thermodynamics uh, of black holes. And uh, more specifically, we wanted to see uh, what are the semi-classical effects. So everything, so the first slide is just a, a motivation. Uh, everything uh, is based on the, this result from the 70s, from classical general relativity, that uh, the laws of black hole mechanics are uh, formally very similar to uh, the, the laws of thermodynamics. So originally, this is uh, just an analogy, which you can make uh, more complete by identifying the mass of a black hole with the energy or internal, internal energy. The, the, surface gravity with the uh, temperature and the area of the horizon with the entropy. And it was not only until uh, Bekenstein that he, he said, he argued that, uh, okay, we should take this more seriously and we should think of black holes as uh, really thermodynamical systems. And later it was uh, corroborated by Hawking uh, doing uh, calculations of uh, quantum fields in curved backgrounds so that uh, indeed uh, black holes uh, radiate at, uh, uh, at the Hawking temperature. And um, it was not until then that this was made more, more concrete. So this means that we should really uh, think of uh, black holes as a, a real thermal systems. This was uh, the base for many modern developments, such as uh, holography, uh, uh, emerging gravity. And uh, even if you think about uh, quantum gravity, uh, it had ser served us as a basics uh, such that uh, we say now that any co consistent theory of quantum gravity should somehow explain uh, the origin of this uh, thermodynamic entropy of black holes. So there are two important extensions that uh, are uh, important for our study. The first one is that, uh, okay, in general, black holes are not alone by, by themselves, but uh, there are matter around them. So really we should take into account the, uh, the entropy of the whole universe. And for that, we should take into account the, the entropy of the matter and uh, add it to the black hole entropy. Uh, we can define the uh, generalized entropy by adding the two. Uh, classically, this quantity also obeys the second law and it leads to a, a modified first law of uh, thermodynamic in which you can also consider variations of this uh, uh, energy of the matter fields. Yeah. I don't understand. So what is, what is the matter? <laughs> so uh, around, around the black hole? Yes. Yeah. It's not inside. It's no, no. Yeah. Around, yeah, exactly. So you have a theory of gravity coupled to matter. Uh -huh. And uh, the matter is in some, some field that has some entropy as well. So you should add it on top of the, use the black hole. And the, the second generalization is that uh, uh, this uh, formalism not only applies to black hole horizons, but uh, more general horizons like cosmological horizons or Wingler, or more generally, whenever you have a, a, a killing horizon, you can use the same techniques to uh, develop a notion of thermodynamics. Uh, so this is an assumption or this is... Uh... No, well, the techniques that are used to develop like, uh, uh, to obtain these thermodynamics are covariant phase space techniques. 
then uh, what is important there is that uh, you have a, a conserved quantity, so a, a killing symmetry. Yeah. And uh, uh, you can define the uh, entropy as a uh, as another charge for for this conserved quantity. And you can do it uh, whenever you have a, a killing vector field yeah. uh, with a horizon. So, so repeated horizon. Yes. Any apparent horizon? Um, well, people have tried, but uh, everything that I'm going to be based off is uh, assuming that uh, you have a U1 symmetry. So assuming uh, that uh, the state is in equilibrium. Uh, so in that case, uh, Ayer and Wall proposed a generalization to non-stationary space-times, but uh, yeah, that's uh, different. That's uh, uh, OK, so one point that is worth emphasizing is that uh, the first law uh, of black hole mechanics is classical. So you just compute the mass of the black hole, the, the area. And uh, uh, while the thermodynamic interpretation is not, so you need the quantum field theory in curved space time to arrive to this interpretation. And um, the original calculation of Hawking, okay, it is, it is okay, but uh, it uh, basically assumes that uh, these matter fields and the black hole, they kind of don't talk to each other. They are kind of independent. So, but uh, in real, uh, in a real thermodynamical system, you should allow for exchange of energy, for example, and for that, you should, uh, okay, the, the, uh, the calculation that you should really do is to consider a quantum theory of gravity. The next good thing that you can do if you don't have it is to uh, uh, use semi-classical semi gravity, where now you're gonna allow that uh, your matter fields back react on the geometry, right? So in this way, then uh, these matter fields, quantum matter fields can talk to the geometry and vice versa. Now, solving this equation is notoriously very difficult. The reason is that you should simultaneously determine uh, the metric, but also determine what is the quantum states of the fields, uh, which is uh, very difficult. You can do it perhaps perturbatively and order by order. By order. Uh, and uh, another point is that uh, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details, but uh, uh, this formula itself, is known to uh, lead to some puzzles. So you should take into account that uh, this is valid, but only in certain corner of the, of the, of the, of the of, uh, theory of quantum gravity. Okay, uh, there is another uh, puzzle that uh, is uh, to be of interest for us, that is the black hole information puzzle. Uh, basically, uh, black holes, we know, uh, Hawking, by Hawking, the calculation by Hawking that black holes uh, radiate. And the question here is, is if this radiation evolves unitarily or not. Uh, very recently, this, uh, there was a, recent, uh, a lot of progress on this uh, subject. And uh, the key insight was that uh, uh, the Hawking radiation can be com computed by this uh, quantum extremal surface formula. Uh, this is a rather uh, new development. And uh, the idea is that uh, you can compute the entropy using uh, this is the, the formula, where now uh, I'm going to take the generalized entropy that takes into account the black hole entropy, but also the entropy of uh, uh, matter fields. And then you are going to do this uh, extremization uh, procedure. Um, when, so this formula applies for computing entropy of any uh, gravitational system, but especially when it is applied to the radiation is that it is known as uh, the island formula. Yeah. And using this prescription is that uh, it was argued that uh, you could uh, actually obtain a unitary page curve as opposed to the, uh, the original result by Hawking that, uh, that doesn't follow a page curve, but rather the entropy keeps growing linearly. Uh, so the idea is to, uh, our idea is, was then to um, study the little, uh, these quantum external surfaces in a model where we can exactly solve for the back reaction and study the thermodynamics, including these uh, semi-classical effects. So that's our motivation. Uh, so in order to solve for the back reaction, uh, so that's, it's very, as I said, is uh, solving the semi-classical equation is very difficult, especially in higher dimensions. So 
uh, for to gain an analytical control, we uh, are going to focus on uh, two-dimensional Newton uh, gravities, and uh, uh, we're going to, as I'm going to say, we, we're going to be able to solve explicitly back reaction in this model and uh, study explicitly what is the, the semi-classical thermodynamics. Um, some highlights that I want to point out uh, by now is that uh, uh, in this semi-classical model, uh, we were able to show that uh, the Walt entropy, Walt entropy is the, the entropy that arises using this uh, covariant phase space formalism, is actually gives, uh, is exactly the generalized entropy. This is a, a new result. Uh, Walt entropy in this, uh, in these two dimensional models was explored in the nineties, but uh, crucially they didn't find the, uh, a solution for the back reaction that, uh, that gives this result. This is a, a new solution that we found that gives this, uh, uh, this solution. Then we were able to study the, the thermodynamics. Uh, this is basically the main outcomes of the first paper and uh, later, uh, I think if I have time, I would show you uh, uh, a nice application that uh, which uh, in which we derive a, a page curve for a, an eternal black hole coupled to a a, a bath. Okay, so first uh, let me tell you why uh, why would you care about uh, two dimensional gravity, and uh, one of the reasons uh, is that uh, or besides that is to use it as a toy model is that uh, uh, it arises uh, as a near horizon, uh, as a near horizon theory of certain extremal black holes. So it, uh, it encodes a part of uh, higher dimensional physics. So this is a, a Penrose diagram of a charged black hole. And uh, if you focus on the near horizon region, what, uh, what uh, if you zoom in, then uh, you get uh, with this factor here. This factor is exactly an ABS2 factor. And, uh, and this is the Penrose diagram exactly of, uh, of uh, this portion. And uh, more specifically, uh, you can start uh, mathematically with a, a solution uh, of a charged black hole. And when you do the dimensional reduction to uh, two dimensions, then it turns out that uh, the theory that you uh, arrive at is uh, exactly uh, this Dilaton uh, theory of gravity that is called the uh, Jacquick state uh, gravity. So in two dimensions, uh, you need uh, uh, matter to, to have some dynamics, otherwise uh, gravity itself, uh, there, is no, no, there are no degrees of freedom. Uh, what gives the dynamics here is the Dilaton here. The Dilaton arises as a this coordinate that measures the, the distance, the radius of the, of, the, of the sphere that you got rid of. And uh, uh, yeah, this is the exact, this coupling, this uh, non-minimal coupling is what gives you the, the dynamics. Uh, this second line here arises from uh, also the, the, the reduction of the gibbons hawking your term. Uh, so now I have this, uh, this, this action, two-dimensional action. Uh, I can just uh, find the equations of motion and I can solve them. Uh, it turns out that uh, the dilaton equation of motion, so when I vary with respect to the dilaton, uh, that equation is what fixes uh, the metric. So normally you vary with respect to the metric and that's gives you the Einstein, Einstein's equation, but in this case, it's, it's the opposite. You vary with respect to phi, and you get that uh, essentially that this, this term here is equal to zero. That fixes you uh, the, the metric. And, uh, and in this classical theory, uh, you can see that uh, a two-dimensional black hole of this form is a, is a solution. This is an eternal ABS2 black hole. This mu is a, a mass parameter. Uh, can identify as the ADM mass of, uh, of, the, of the background. And uh, uh, the gravitational equations of motion, now that that is when you vary with respect to the metric, 
is what fixes the, the solution for the dilaton. So for this solution, then you can easily solve the, the, the equation for the dilaton, uh, for, for the, the gravity equation that now fixes the dilaton, and you get this, uh, this uh, simple solution here. Uh, now that you have this uh, basic uh, black hole solution, you can study the classical thermodynamics using the standard tools. You can go to Euclidean space and you can, uh, to avoid uh, having the conical singularity, you can identify the Euclidean time and that's what gives you the temperature. And you get the, the standard results, the temperature that is proportional to this, uh, this mass parameter, uh, the area, in this case, it is two-dimensional. Uh, instead of the area, you get uh, the value of the of the dilaton evaluated at the horizon. And from here, you can uh, you can derive a, a first law for, for this black hole. So this was done a long time ago in the 90s. Uh, what I want to point out here is that uh, uh, very recently it has gained attention again this uh, two-dimensional theories of gravity. Uh, because we can make a lot of progress in the, in the context of quantum gravity. So uh, a couple of years ago, for example, Harlow realized that uh, this theory, you can uh, use uh, uh, standard tools of uh, uh, quantize, uh, canonical quantization. You can canonically quantize the theory. Uh, now, it, it is also uh, uh, interesting because it provides a, a concrete uh, setup in which you can test this nearly ABS2 CFT1 uh, duality and uh, because of its connection with the SYK model. Uh, it has also been realized that you can uh, compute the full uh, perturbative and non-perturbative uh, Euclidean path integral that is sum over all topologies and that is done by realizing that uh, in certain regime you can you can uh, re-express this theory as a certain matrix model. And, uh, uh, and there's a, a lot of progress uh, in, uh, in, in that context. For my purposes, uh, I'm not gonna do a, a fully non-perturbative or I'm not gonna be dealing with topologies. What is important for me is that uh, uh, the bad reaction is exactly solvable and that uh, I can, I will be able to connect that with the recent uh, developments in, in the black hole information problem. Okay, okay so um, that was what I presented was the classical JT gravity. Now what I want is to include matter fields, uh, quantum matter fields and, and study the interaction between the two, right? So how do we do that? We add uh, C massless scalar fields. And uh, classically, uh, this massless scalar field, uh, 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 the stress tensor is uh, traceless, right? It's a conformal theory. But quantum mechanically, uh, uh, it has a, this theory has a, a, an anomaly. That means that uh, when you compute the expectation value of the stress tensor, uh, it, it is no longer traceless. And uh, this implies that uh, uh, when you transform from one, uh, uh, one frame to another another frame, you, uh, the, the stress sensor transforms anomaly, uh, uh, anom with a, there is an anomaly essentially. So it doesn't transform as a tensor, but you should uh, transform it as a, using the, the there is an extra piece that is the charge and derivative and you should transform it in that, in that way. Now, interestingly, uh, you can include the effect of this anomaly and uh, up to uh, one loop by studying the, the, what is known as the one loop quantum effective action. Now this, this effective action is generally non-local. I didn't write it here, uh, but uh, it's, it's very non-local. But uh, the key point that was realized a uh, long time ago is that uh, you can express it uh, locally by introducing uh, this uh, auxiliary uh, field, chi, and uh, this is what is known as the Polyakov action. This is, the Polyakov showed that uh, uh, this action uh, is equivalent to this non-local expression that arises from integrating out the, the loops. And uh, so it is nice because it's local and, uh, and uh, you can couple it 
to your classical uh, JT theory. And uh, even in the presence of this uh, uh, one loop action, uh, you can solve it analytically. Okay, so. Uh, so the roughly R one over box R. Yeah, exactly. R one over box R. Yeah, so. Uh, so, this, so this action is, well, uh, the level of the action is just like this uh, uh, long grass construction. Yeah, exactly. So now uh, we want to include this term now and study what is the effect on the, on the back gravity background and study the thermodynamics in that, in that context. Now, uh, the equation of motion for uh, the gravity part, so when you vary with respect to the metric, gives you this equation here. This is the stress tensor that you get from the dilaton. So then, then your full action is the JT gravity plus yeah. this piece. Yes, exactly. So we have, so we have phi plus chi. So you, you, you have yes. R couples to the sun. Yeah, so uh, the dilaton doesn't have a kinetic term. It, it's only couples to the, yeah. so there is phi r. <coughs> For this auxiliary field, we have a kinetic term, but we also have this coupling. But importantly, uh, this chi field doesn't couple directly to the dilaton. So that, I'm gonna mention that in the next slide. Uh, so the equation of motion for gravity that is varying with respect to the metric gives you this, this equation. And uh, uh, this means that uh, uh, the solution for phi is affected of what this, this auxiliary chi field is doing. But very importantly, uh, as I said, uh, this chi doesn't couple to phi. So the equations that uh, you get from varying with respect to phi are unaffected. I said that before that uh, those are the questions that give you the, the metric. That means that uh, even in the presence of, uh, of these uh, uh, quantum fields, uh, the eternal DS2 black hole solutions remains uh, a valid background at the level of the metric, right? So the only thing that is affected is phi, and now chi will also have a, a non-trivial profile. So is this a clean or because? Then why is this, sorry, why is this a, a quantum expectation? Um, yeah, so this, exactly. So this is a, uh, an auxiliary field that you can treat as classical, but uh, really uh, comes from integrating out this uh, one loop uh, effects. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, so you interpret it as a quantum expectation value of the original theory that is, uh, a set of C massless scalar fields. Yes, exactly. Um, well, so we're interested in the semi classical limit. So the classical limit is when uh, G goes to zero, that's the, the gravity part. Uh, but now, in order to for the back reaction to also enter into the game, you need to take this limit. You need to take the limit where C goes to uh, infinity, but uh, keeping this constant fixed. So if I go back to my action, uh, there is a C in front of the action, but the gravity part has a one over G in front, right? So if I factor the one over G, I get that uh, CG here on, on the top, and I want that to be fixed. And finite in order to be able to compete with the gravity part. But here it's crucial that C cannot be a reabsorbed. They could define chi to a reabsorbed C, but they have this linear term. Yes, so, so, the yeah, so we want the two, the two parts, the gravity and this uh, quantum part, to enter at the same order. That's why we need to take this limit. And yeah, it is important that C is not lost in the process. So, we cannot set it to one because uh, it will be negligible with respect to the gravity part. Um, okay. Uh, now, uh, there are two states of interest, the Bulwer state and the Hurtle Hawking. Uh, well, in the paper we did, uh, uh, we analyzed the two states, but uh, 
But here I'm just going to focus on the Horty Hawking that is a, can be interpreted as a, as a thermal state. And uh, in order to understand this a little bit better, uh, it is uh, important to introduce this uh, two set of coordinates. Uh, the two are, are important, actually. Uh, the key point is that in two dimensions, any, any metric can be written as a conformally flat metric. So this is essentially flat space, and this is the conformal factor. Uh, in this uh, set of coordinates are advanced and retard static coordinates. So I started with the, the, the coordinates that I go down here. And I, I define the tortoise coordinate, and then I define these null coordinates. Uh, but this only cover uh, one part of the, of the Penrose diagram. Let's say the right right part. Uh, these are global cross scale coordinates. Uh, again, I can write it in this form because it's a, a two dimensional metric. Uh, but uh, just don't confuse these two. These two are different conformal conformal factors. And these global cross scale coordinates they cover the full the, all the all the Penrose diagram. Uh, it, for the interpretation, it's, it is important that uh, uh, for the Hartle Hawking. Uh, the horte hawking state uh, can be interpreted as a thermal state for a static observer. That means that the expectation value in, the, in these coordinates uh, take, uh, take this form. And uh, um, yeah, it turns out that when you transform it to this uh, global uh, cross scale coordinate, then uh, it, uh, it gets zero, uh, a zero value. And this is because of uh, this transformation that I was telling you about, that we transform anomaly. Uh, there is an anomaly. Now I can I can take uh, this. Ah, uh, zero. Zero. Yes. Um, you can consider other states where it is non-zero, but um, we are interested in static uh, states. Uh, the bull were. It's also static, but it's a little bit more complicated. There you have to kill. So you have a left moving and right moving modes. You kill one of the set, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, for my purposes, uh, it is enough to consider the particle hawking. So, so what is it? The, so these two, two sets of coordinates, they have to be related very easily. There's not much you can do to preserve the form of the metric. It's a, uh, a vile transformation. Yeah. So that's why you get this uh, C. Yeah, so yeah it's, a, it's a, exactly. So it's a vital transformation. It's, it's a vital transformation. transformation. Yeah, but but uh, in order to transform the stress tensor, you need to add this uh, uh, Schwarzian term. No, 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 trivial. There's a formal. Yes, uh, exactly. So it's, it's a vital transformation independent of P and nu. It's, it's independent. It's independent. The sorry. The vital transformation is independent of is is just a global vital transformation, not a local one. Mm, you, yeah, I don't you destroy sorry. the metric. I mean, you could change the metric completely. Um, I, I think these are not just okay, the scaling of the plane to the plane. So yeah, yeah, global plane. Yeah, yeah, but independent of the point. I mean. Oh, the spacing, the spacing is Okay, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, these two are different functions. That's... Yeah, no, I know, but if you change large V by some function of U and V, then you would get a diagonal terms, or you would get other yes. terms. That must be a very particular. So you go ahead and uh, with this uh, state or the state that you want, you can uh, so solve the, the back reaction. Uh, I'm not showing here the steps, but uh, uh, I'm just, just showing you the results. So I told you that the metric remains the same. For phi, you get this semi-classical correction that is uh, quite easy. For the Bulwer state, you get uh, something that is more complicated, but for the Hockey Hockey, you get uh, this simple correction. And uh, importantly, uh, this uh, solution for, for Kai, this is the one that I advertised that we found that is a new solution. So in previous literature, 
they found a solution with some constants that were fixed, but uh, we found the more general solution that is with the arbitrary uh, constants in, uh, with arbitrary constants here. And this was really important later for the identification of the of uh, of the wall entropy as a generalized entropy. So I will I will show later uh, that, that part, but. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is that this is a new solution that was missed in the in this uh, classical papers of uh, in, in JT gravity. <clears throat> so in the case of zero, mm -hmm. like everything organized as a product of UAB. Is that uh, the point? Uh, yeah, no. yes, that's true. That way. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was not easy to get to this uh, solution because the equation is uh, very nonlinear. But uh, with some tricks, we were able to find to find it with these arbitrary constants. Uh, okay. Next. Uh, well, now you that you have the back reaction, you want to study the thermodynamics. The first thing is to study the the wild entropy. So, as I said, every time that you have a, a killing vector. In this case, a time-like killing vector. You can uh, use uh, the nether charge formalism, or also called higher wall formalism, for example. And you can arrive to the uh, to an expression for the conserved charge that is, in this case, the, the wall entropy. It's called as the wall entropy. You apply it to the solution, and you get uh, this expression that must be evaluated at the bifurcate horizon. Uh, so the first part uh, is the standard term is the what what in two dimensions is equivalent to the area term. The second part is the semi-classical correction, and uh, something that is important is that uh, uh, this expression is state dependent, right? So I told you that uh, depending on if what is your vacuum, uh, you have different solutions for phi and chi. And uh, Another point is that uh, in, the, in the state that I'm telling you about, that is the Hartley Hawking, uh, since that state can be interpreted as a thermal state, then uh, this entropy can be interpreted genuinely as a thermodynamic entropy. Okay, next, uh, I, was, I was showing you two slides ago that uh, we arrived to this uh, general solution. Uh, it turns out that you can fix them, fix these constants in a way that uh, this correction gives exactly uh, uh, what it is expected for, uh, uh, for the von Neumann entropy of a two-dimensional CFT. So the way you do it is to first solve, uh, so get a general solution for chi in flat space. Uh, that's the solution that I presented to you. Then you impose a Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions at the, uh, at, the, at the boundary or at any cutoff surface that you want. And then uh, once you have the solution, you perform a, a vial transformation back to uh, ABS space, right? Uh, once you do that, you follow these three steps, you get uh, this, this solution here. Now, instead of these constants, I have these arbitrary uh, points U prime and B prime. And this is exactly the expression of the, uh, the entanglement entropy or von Neumann entropy for an interval of a two-dimensional CFT. So I would like to draw uh, yeah. some. Can we raise that if you want to? Yeah. I'm sorry for the people online. I cannot turn the camera. So, well, maybe I can manually. It's okay. Don't it's worry. Okay. <laughs> What you imagine is to have a, a cutoff surface and uh, having a, an arbitrary point u prime v prime, and this solution for chi so is a solution such that at any given point here u and v, it gives you the entanglement entropy of this uh, uh, of this interval. This is we have a CFT in the water. Okay. 
And uh, uh, well, it doesn't matter what is the shape of this uh, sigma, because uh, entanglement entropy is, uh, is independent on the shape. It's actually, you should not think of the, of the interval on a fixed slice, but uh, you can pick any slice that is associated to this uh, diamond. So, so, so the sigma is light like? No. No, 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 no. space like. But uh, uh, the expression that I'm showing you there is the entanglement entropy of, of uh, associated to this uh, to any sigma with these boundary conditions. So, sorry, what are you integrating out in this by this uh, this entanglement entropy? So, what is the complement? Oh, uh, you have a, a any any slice. Ah, okay, okay. Any slice. Uh, this is the full slice sigma. Right. right. And we're integrating now the complement. Right. So Kai gives you exactly the, okay, the yeah. is parameterized by the entanglement uh, Yes. Uh, so using this, uh, this uh, following these steps, we were able to fix these con constants such that uh, uh, we get we got this correct semi classical correction that exactly matches the von Neumann entropy of uh, an interval. In a, in a CFT. The CFT is the CFT of the, the bulk CFT. Okay. And this is a. a well, what happens when your <coughs> interval covers the whole slice? You, you get zero. That's it. Because the state is, is pure. Yeah. Yeah, you, take, you need to take limits where uh, U prime and B prime go to, goes to the right boundary yeah. and U and B go, go to the left boundary. Uh, uh, you should get zero, but uh, I mean this uh, expression is uh, is, one well, in the, is well known. You yes. Get one. Uh -huh. oh, okay. What what are delta one? Ah, uh, oh, I forgot. Probably is it what you need to get a one there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, this, uh, I think this are associated to. Uh, cutoff, bulk cutoff, but uh, yeah, at this moment I so also got lost. So yeah. I thought you were not changing the metric. I mean, the, the I'm metric. not changing the metric. The so metric is fixed. When you say solid in flat space, what do you mean? Okay. Yeah. So um, right. So. Um, since we are doing a quantum field theory in a curved space, then uh, I'm solving this, uh, the, the, the equation for chi on flat space, and then I'm doing a bile transformation back to ADS space. Okay, so this is a trick to the, the, the curve. Yeah, this is. Oh, a trick that you can only do in two dimensional theories because yeah. any metric can be written as a conformally flat metric. Yeah. Using conformal yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, the first big uh, result of the paper. And uh, it was this, uh, this realization that when you do things properly, the wild entropy is actually the generalized entropy. And this actually resolves a, a puzzle that uh, was raised in the 90s. So, when they tried to do this calculation originally, they didn't find this more general solution. And uh, as a result, the, what they got for the wall entropy was uh, something that uh, captures only a portion of, uh, of the generalized entropy, but not all of it. What uh, the, uh, the, the, constants. the constants that they, they fixed it, they, they fix it to a, a particular value, but they didn't find the more general solution. Did, you, did I miss it? You, did you speak about quantum extremals? Or yeah, so far, I'm not. Uh, do, I, so far, not. Maybe I slept. <laughs> yeah. Next. <laughs> Next. So we have a, a generalized, uh, this result that wall entropy is generalized entropy. Now, uh, I want to find a, a quantum extremal surface, surface by uh, extremizing over basically the position of this, uh, this interval that I'm, I'm drawing here. So far, uh, I'm not uh, arguing or I'm not, I'm not explaining the why I'm extremizing this. 
but uh, uh, this is only motivated by the, the, the quantum stima surface formula. But uh, later, I will explain that uh, it is natural to consider this extremization if you work in the microcanonical ensemble. And I will explain why. But for now, let me just continue with this, with this ad hoc extremization. So what I want to do is to uh, take the full expression for the generalized entropy, fix. Uh, so this generalized entropy, uh, what I'm doing is fix these points, B prime and B prime, and vary with respect to U and B, right? And by doing so, uh, we get a solution, an extreme of that. And uh, this is uh, what is known as the quantum extremal surface. And uh, what you find is that uh, uh, this, uh, this surface that extremizes this, the, the sun lies uh, a little bit uh, a delta away from the horizon. This delta away is, param is uh, param uh, parametrically, is parametrically close to the horizon, but uh, now we have this, this epsilon where these constants, uh, the back reaction part enters in, into, into the game. Okay, so uh, these quantum maximal surfaces were also found uh, in, this, in this work. So can you draw it more or less? It just goes slightly away from the price. Yeah, so classically, It's like here, an epsilon away. It's here. I'm, I'm gonna do it. I have a figure here. Uh, I have a figure in the next slide, but uh, um, it is a little bit uh, uh, away from the horizon, and it defines uh, a nested Rindler wedge. So it's uh, it's like this this figure here. This is the point of the quantum external surface. Uh, so that means that uh, when you extremize this generalized entropy, uh, uh, it is not evaluated at the bifurcation surface of the black hole, but now at the bifurcation surface of this uh, of an, another killing vector. Uh, that killing vector is the uh, Rindler generator of uh, Rindler time for this uh, for this smaller wedge. Okay, so. So I'm, I'm lost with the construction. So where is the, the many surfaces about? So, so the, the surface is that point. That point is a yeah. That point. So uh, because you're thinking four dimensions. No, uh, it's a co-dimension two. Uh, that's a uh, so black hole horizon is a co-dimension two. A right. quantum external surface is also ah, okay. a co-dimension two. In this case, it's a point. It's a point. It's a right. point. So the, a point is what you call an external surface. Yes. And uh, what I'm saying is that uh, normally for black hole thermodynamics, you evaluate the generalized entropy at the bifurcate, bifurcate horizon of the black hole. So it's here. Uh, when you compute uh, quantum external surfaces, you are now evaluating the generalized entropy at this point. This point is now a bifurcate horizon, but now of a, another killing vector. This killing vector is a, a, a generator of time translations in this along this smaller wedge. Okay, so there is actually, as I said, there is another killing vector. And from that killing vector, you can use all the technology of Ayer and Wald of covariant phase space formalism to study the thermodynamics. That's uh, the next thing that, uh, that we did. Uh, so can you say it again? What is peculiar about this new clean field? How, how do you characterize this? this uh, yeah, so uh, any smaller uh, Ringler wedge yeah. also has a, a killing symmetry, right? So it's, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, yeah. a special uh, Ringler, uh, uh, Ringler wedge. And uh, it's, it's peculiar because uh, the bifurcate horizon extremizes the generalized entropy. So this fixes exactly the point? Yeah, this fixes this point. In terms of what? 
constants? Yeah, the other constants are these uh, U prime and V prime that are kept fixed and at the at the at the horizon at the boundary. Sorry. Ah, okay. So. Okay, so this is to explain more a little bit. So uh, the generalized entropy now uh, captures the, the area of this bifurcate oops, horizon. And uh, plus the von Neumann entropy of this interval here. And uh, we have a, a key vector that is the uh, uh, translation of uh, Rindler time in this wedge. And we have a new uh, kappa, that is the, the surface gravity associated by, by this new observer, right? So just uh, do not confuse this kappa with the kappa that is uh, uh, the surface gravity at the, at the black hole horizon. This kappa is the surface gravity at, the, at, this, at this new bifurcate horizon. Uh, okay, so we want to study the thermodynamics. The easiest way to do it is to start from a smart relation. A smart relation is, is really a, a relation that relates all the thermodynamic variables. So here is just a, a one slide to, to remind you what you expect normally in black hole thermodynamics. Uh, notably, when you have a, a black hole in ABS, you get this extra term here that is actually needed for consistency of the, of the smart law. And uh, uh, once you have the smart relation, you can vary it and you can arrive to a first law. So normally uh, this term is, is always uh, constant, but uh, some people recently uh, like to consider this extended thermodynamics where now you can interpret the cosmological constant as a, as a pressure and you can also vary, vary that, arrive to a, a generalized first law. But uh, uh, if you are doing just standard thermodynamics, you can assume that this term is constant and you can arrive to the standard first law of thermodynamics. Now, this, these expressions uh, are also derived using covariant phase, phase techniques. I'm not showing the details, but uh, I'm showing you the result here for our setup. So we start with the, our killing vector and uh, we arrive to this expression here. Here we have a, a classical a quasi local or asymptotic energy. This is the semi classical correction. This term here is the analogous to the area term, well, this part. And here is the semi classical correction that now, in, in our context, gives you the von Neumann entropy. And this term, these two terms are, are also there for consistency. These are analogous to, to this term here. Uh, that we have uh, explicit expressions for, for that. We can then vary, vary to arrive to a first law. And importantly, uh, we get uh, a first law that uh, with these extra pieces now that can be associated to, to the matter fields, extra matter field. This is what I was advertising at the beginning of the talk. And the uh, uh, next step is to try to uh, really uh, to provide a, an interpretation, a thermodynamic interpretation of this first law. The crucial observation is that uh, in the hartle hawking state, uh, so what we needed to ask, what does an, an static observer in this wedge sees, right? Uh, it's different a uh, static observer in the larger uh, wedge to the smaller one, right? And, uh, when you do the, the calculation of the stress tensor now, when you specialize it to the coordinates adapted to the smaller wedge, uh, and you do the appropriate uh, transform bias transformation, you get to this expression. This essentially tells you that uh, uh, a static observer in this smaller wedge also sees uh, uh, a thermal state, but now at this different temperature. This, uh, New temperature is the one associated with the with the surface gravity evaluated at uh, at the new bifurcation point. Okay, uh, with now with this in mind, then we can easily write this as uh, the first law that we were expecting expecting from the beginning. Here we have a 
the classical and semi-classical corrections to the to the quasi-local energies, the temperature that is felt by a, a static observer in this wedge, generalized entropy, and then this uh, contribution from uh, 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 the Hamiltonian of the matter fields. Um, yeah, okay. So everything that I've tell you about so far has been assuming uh, the canonical ensemble. That's what uh, normally is done, right? So you start with a thermal ensemble, you fix your temperature, and uh, and uh, you derive thermodynamics in that ensemble, right? So normally what is done is you define a, a thermodynamic potential. So in the canonical ensemble is the Hellman's uh, free energy. And uh, your state can, can be found by, by by finding an extreme of your thermodynamic potential. Similarly, you can you can, could have started from another ensemble. Uh, for us, it's going to be important the microcanonical ensemble, where instead of fixing the temperature, you fix now the energy. And uh, uh, well, it is known in, in general thermodynamic systems how to go from one to the other. So you just do a Legendre transformation of your potential, and then you extremize a new potential, right? Uh, what is important is that the new potential in the microcanonical ensemble is exactly the, the, the entropy. And that is important because uh, now in this new ensemble, the extremization of, the, of what I advertised, the, of the quantum extremal surface arises naturally by just uh, uh, finding an extremum of your thermodynamic potential in this new ensemble, right? Now, uh, this can be done for a... Uh, general thermodynamic systems. Uh, in the 90s, it was developed uh, a formalism to apply this to gravitational systems. Uh, this is a formalism by Brown and York. And uh, essentially, uh, it boils down to adding uh, an appropriate counterterm. So normally in the canonical ensemble, you find your Euclidean onshell action. That's what gives you your, your free energy. And uh, here you are going to do the same, but now you add an appropriate uh, boundary term that changes the from one ensemble to the other. And uh, from that new ensemble, what we found doing this uh, 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 Legendre transformation, you find that exactly uh, this uh, microcanonical energy is exactly uh, what, what we found, uh, exactly this generalized entropy. So um, that's the second result that, uh, that we obtained is that uh, uh, really uh, in this uh, new ensemble, uh, this extremization condition that, uh, that you derive via other methods, via uh, uh, like the quantum external surface prescription was derived using the replica trick, for example. You can, you can now derive it naturally by doing a, a microcanonical path integral and uh, analyzing the, the saddle point approximation. The saddle point approximation gives rise to this semi-classical physics. But was this not uh, somehow, in, once you get the smart relations, which is an integrated form, is this not? Uh, well, the smart relation is independent on the ensemble. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you can, bring one to another side and it's, it's a sum of terms so you can decide which one is independent and leave it on the left and then so it's for me the same to say e equals t s plus pv then just bringing s to the other side and saying s is e over t yeah exactly, exactly. Integrated. Uh, yeah yeah what what we are arguing is that by working in this ensemble uh, we can derive this extremization condition only from thermodynamics, right? Before you needed this extra input. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the, the insight of, of, of that, of our result. And uh, on a separate note, then uh, it implies that uh, if you work in this microcanonical ensemble, then it is more natural to, instead of considering, when you are studying uh, black hole thermodynamics, it's more natural to consider this uh, this new bifurcate horizon that rather than the, that the one that is associated to the, the actual black hole. Okay. 
Okay, so this is a summary of this part, but I really want to flash at least a couple of slides of the shorter paper. Uh, basically, uh, we want to apply this to the case of uh, evaporating black holes, but uh, really to use this thermodynamic uh, framework, uh, we cannot use it for a, a, a dynamical setting. Instead, we, we can do it for a, an eternal black hole coupled to a bat. So this is a, a setup that has its own information problem, right? So uh, the page curve that is expected for a, a, an evaporating black hole is of this form. First, uh, when you compute the, uh, the entropy of the radiation, it grows linearly up to certain point where uh, the extra radiation purifies the, the, uh, the state. And uh, at the end of the day, once the black hole is completely evaporated, you should get, uh, go back to having a von Neumann entropy zero because the, the state is pure. Similarly, there is a, a, an information shown puzzle for, for an eternal black hole. Uh, so this is the setup more precisely. You start with an ABS eternal black hole, then you couple it to a bath. That is by gluing, you glue these uh, uh, flat space uh, portions in which the radiation can escape to and never come back. And the idea is that uh, you are gonna, to, to keep it eternal, you're gonna pump energy to the black hole to, to keep it, its uh, mass fixed, right? So you pump energy and at the same time, you, you let the Hawking radiation to, to go away to these uh, flat space regions. So in, uh, in few words, uh, the new uh, paradox in this setting is that uh, in, in this setting also the original calculation by Hawking uh, leads you to an entropy that keeps growing, but uh, it should be bounded by the coarse grain entropy of the black hole, that is the, the two times the black hole entropy, two because this is a two-sided two setup. And uh, the page curve in this case should be uh, given by this, this curve here. Uh, very recently, it was argued that a unitary page curve can be obtained using the, the QES formula, and more specifically, when you apply it to uh, the radiation, it's known as the island formula. Uh, this is what it looks like when you apply it to uh, our setting, the two-dimensional setting. Uh, the key point is that uh, normally, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, slice, uh, is uh, co corresponds to one one single interval, but uh, the key point or the key insight of the island formula is that now you can connect disconnected regions, and that uh, a priori uh, by in including these disconnected regions that are called islands, uh, is very bad. Uh, it's not uh, entropically fa uh, favored because uh, then you add a lot of entropy. Uh, you by this term, but uh, uh, in this case, it, it is it turns out to be favorable, right? So there is a regime in which uh, it is convenient to add this uh, disconnected piece, and it will in turn lower uh, the, the entropy of the, of the radiation. This was uh, derived uh, using the replica trick in the context of uh, two-dimensional ABS black hole, black holes, both static and dynamical, but uh, uh, these techniques, uh, first, they cannot be easily adapted to other contexts, such as flat or the or other backgrounds, or even to higher dimensions, it's not clear how to generalize it. But I mean, it is expected to, to hold somehow. So in our setting, let me just uh, briefly mention, uh, instead of doing this, uh, a replicated uh, path integral. So that's the, the way how people normally derive the, the island formula. You do this uh, replica trick and you glue this, uh, have this, uh, this manifold with multiple copies. And uh, it turns out that uh, in certain regime there, there, is a, there are new gravitational solutions that dominate, that are the replica wormholes. And these replica wormholes are the ones that lead to this uh, island, island saddle. In our case, uh, we are not doing the, uh, the replicated 
path integral. Instead, we are doing a microcanonical path integral. And uh, what everything that we need to do is to evaluate uh, evaluate the microcanonical action restricted to these causal diamonds here, right? So this is the setting that I was telling you about. Uh, in this saddle point, uh, the radiation is uh, uh, encapsulated by these two, uh, these two disconnected uh, uh, regions, these two uh, intervals. But uh, since the, the state is pure, you can actually consider the, the entropy of the complement. The complement is the, uh, this interval here. Uh, in the case that there is a, an island uh, formula, uh, the radiation would be given by these two uh, segments plus the island part. But again, since the, the, the state is, global state is pure, you can compute the entropy of uh, these two intervals. And uh, it basically boils down to evaluate the, the action in this diamond and in these two diamonds, and then compare the two. <coughs> And uh, well, I, I didn't uh, show here the, the result, but uh, when you do it, you realize that uh, uh, you, are, you get uh, uh, the expectations from, from the other calculation. So we could recover this, uh, this, uh, this result based on the thermodynamics in the microcanonical ensemble. Now one, uh, let's say, uh, a uh, minor issue of our calculation is that um, it only applies to uh, eternal black holes. So any, any background that has a U1 uh, symmetry works, but uh, the good thing on the other hand is that it can be extended to other, not only ADS, but other backgrounds, flat space, the sitter. And in fact, uh, very recently uh, this, uh, in this paper, they analyzed they analyzed it and they derived it from the case of the sitter in two dimensions. This was uh, Berlin Day and some other people. And uh, yeah, so in, in summary, uh, what uh, our work provides is a, a different way to obtain a, a page curve using thermodynamics in the microcanonical ensemble and, uh, and to explain the origin of this uh, extremization of, uh, of the entropy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you.